good evening. <laughs> I lost today. Hello, I can't hear myself in the monitors. Testing, one, two. Testing. Yeah, I'm not getting anything in the monitors. No. Testing, okay. one, two. Do you have monitor? I do, yeah. I don't have monitor. Oh, huh? are you plugged? Just one of them. I don't know where the power cord is plugged. It is right here. Testing one two. I haven't had it since Sunday. No, I wasn't using it. Testing. Testing, testing. Power? It's not on. There we go. You got it? Testing one, two, got it. Is that a yes? Yes, I have. I have a juice. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's give the evening to the Lord. <laughs> Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you once again that we can just gather in your name. And Lord, just, edif just be edified, be drawn closer to you. Uh, to be uh, mended and and healed and strengthened, loved upon, cared for, just to experience, Lord, your grace and mercy and love. Oh, that we could just stay there just constantly and just soak up, Lord, your character, your beauty and your wonder. And Lord, we just thank you for being here. We thank you for your presence and just the greater awareness of your presence in our life. And Father, no matter what we're doing, what we're partaking of or in, Lord, that we know that you are there in the midst of it. And Lord, I just pray for all those that you've brought tonight, either in person, Lord, or via the uh, live stream, that, Lord, you would just bless them as they seek your face and search for you, Lord, just to know you better deeper in a more rich way or a richer way lord father just praying lord that you would just anoint our time together tonight that father you would anoint the message lord that you've prepared and lord just in spite of me lord that you would bless the saints lord we love you father and we thank you for your goodness lord and just all your grace father and we lift this time before you now and we ask again, Lord, for your anointing and for your blessing upon our time. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, 
He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who ever makes a way. He hung upon that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. 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 When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I fight I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if you are for me Who can be against me? There's nothing impossible. 
impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty too. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, So I kneel before you, God. 
I lift my hands cause you set me free so I'll shout at your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours I am yours all that I am a place in loving hands cause I am yours I am yours here I am I stand with arms wide open to the one the sun the everlasting God the everlasting God Here I am, I stand with arms wide open to the one, the sun, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. So I'll shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours. I am yours. All that I am, I place into your loving hands, cause I am yours. I am yours. Here I am, I stand with arms wide open to the one, the sun. The everlasting God, the everlasting God. You were the Word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no evil. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a 
the powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name. song of love to my Savior to my Jesus I'm grateful for the things you've done my loving Savior precious Jesus My heart is glad that you called me your own. There's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love. In your arms of love. Holding me still.
sing a simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior, my precious Jesus. My heart is glad that you called me your own. There's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love. In your arms of love. Holding me still. Holding me near in your arms of love. Arms of love. My heart is glad that you called me your own. There's no place I'd rather be than in your arms.
you, Jesus. Yes, we love you, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are our God. You're our rock. You're our shield. You're our deliverer. God, we thank you so much that you have pulled us from that miry pit of despondency and despair. And you set our feet on the rock, the solid ground of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we, you've established our steps and, and you've made our way clear by the light of your word. We thank you so much that you're our redeemer, God. You bought us back from our unworthy state, Lord, of sin and wickedness and rebellion. And you've given us your sweet robes of righteousness to wrap around us so that we can stand before you here and now, Lord God. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for all the treasures that you've laid at our feet as, as we've gone through this Old Testament, Genesis and Exodus so far, God. And we know that there are many more awesome and amazing, rich treasures to open up still. And we ask that you would open up our hearts to be ready for those treasures, God. And we ask that you would pour out your mercy and grace and, and power and spirit on Pastor Joe as he teaches us from your word, God. Lord, you are so good. We love you, we praise you, we worship you. And thank you again for this amazing family that you've blessed us with, that we get to spend eternity with, with you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Love one another. Hi, everybody. Another Wednesday. What's that? Cheers. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say that um, this this <laughs> this evening uh, um, when we were coming in, uh, Ike and um, and uh, Jim, we were talking about that. There was a program a long time ago, and some of you guys aren't old enough to remember this show, but it was called Cheers. And, um, 
And when people would walk into the bar, everybody knew their names. They'd say, Norm, you know, like that. So when Ike and Jim were walking in, I'd go, Ike, Jim, like that. And, they, and it's like, it was reminiscent of that, of that thing where everybody knows your name. You know, we're a, fam a family. Was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Ike said. Ike said he was Cliff. <laughs> Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, my daughter called me up today. I mean, she calls me up every day. But I mean, she was talking to me today about this uh, Ukrainian thing, you know, that Russia's attacking Ukraine. And then my uh, other son that's up in Washington phones me up and tells me about the stock market and crypto and all that. And then my other son, Aaron's talking about uh, the gas prices are going up. To all of them, I said the same thing, you know, God's in control. I said, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, the economy goes up, the economy goes down. It goes up and down. Don't worry. I mean, God knows what's going on, you know, he, and they're all Christians, so just pray about it, you know. So anyway, that was what happened today. Uh, okay, today we're in Exodus chapter 14, and it is 31 verses. We won't read that many, but we'll wait till the pastor's ready. But it's all about the crossing of the Red Sea. There was just one miracle after another, you know. And you would think they would learn, but they still disobeyed in the wilderness. So, but anyway, that's beside the point, I guess. Okay, the Red Sea crossing. Exodus chapter 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Oh, it is up there. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I get intimidated with stuff there because then I can't make a mistake. See, if I'm reading it, then you're saying, oh, he missed that word or something. But anyway. Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before whatever that is, P-Hiroth, between Mughal and the sea, oppose Baal and Zephron. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled. And the heart of the Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. Are you ready? We'll stop there. Okay. okay, let's pray. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for another day that we get to come to church and, and worship you and praise you without fear of being thrown in jail and, or put in a concentration camp. We do love you and praise you. Please pour out your Holy Spirit on the pastor, our pastor today, as he uh, gives your word and teaches us from your word. And we do praise you and give you all the love, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody okay? Good. At least one of us will be, right? I mean, who has had something really funny to laugh at this week? Anybody? No, I'm just looking for something to laugh at. <laughs> Jim, do you have something funny happened this week? Yes, two, 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 two. Yeah. A board game. Yeah, he clears the table. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's like us sometimes when we 
have our little tantrums and we clear the table on the Lord. And, you know, it doesn't go real well, typically. Well, let's open your Bibles, if you're not there already, to Exodus chapter 14. Last time with the Exodus, we learned that when it's time to go, you got to go. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we saw that there's no temptation. We saw that also in Corinthians as well. But there's no temptation that has overtaken you except such that is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with every temptation will also make the way of escape, that you might be able to bear it. God promises to us a way of escape. But we need to be ready to take that way out. Now, although the trip from Egypt to the Promised Land would have been maybe a 10-day journey at most, as the crow flies, it was God's intent that the people would spend a full year getting there, stopping at seven specific campsites. We'll talk more about those later. But at each one of those campsites, they had a very important lesson to learn on the way. Why? We mentioned it, guys. It was one thing for God to get his people out of Egypt, an entirely different thing to get Egypt out of his people. And so there was a leading that was taking place, a leading of the Lord. And we saw how the Lord provided for the nation of Israel a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night in order to guide them and take them in the direction they wanted them, he wanted them to go. And we talked about those three questions, uh, determining which way is the leading of the Lord or which way the Lord is leading us to go in any given situation. And that was number one, is it cool? That is, is it in the shade? Is it something that we're manufacturing or is it something that the Lord is truly telling us in a direction he is leading us to go? Will it count, number two? And number three, does it conform to what the Lord has given to us within his word so that it's not something we're out there on? And so here was the cloud, not two clouds, just one cloud in the daytime. It would bring shade from the desert at night. The cloud gave uh, light, if you would, the pillar that they would follow when they were going down where it was that the Lord wanted them to go, leading them in that cloud. And it was to remind them of God's presence with them. Just as God has left us things to remind us of his presence with us in that leading and in that directing. And the cloud was going to be one of the main ways that the Israelites were going to be guided through the wilderness. All the people had to do in order to know where to go was to follow that pillar of cloud. If the cloud moved, they moved. If the cloud stayed, they stayed. And they had to know where God was leading them in order to follow his presence. That would represented his presence. And that's not always an easy thing to do since we don't have, obviously, a huge pillar for which to follow and see with our eyes. But John chapter 3, verse 8 gives us an idea, perhaps, of how the Lord would want to lead us and guide us. Where it says that the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. And so everyone who is born, or so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so Jesus, in John chapter 3, compared the moving of the Spirit to the wind. And in a way, we're kind of like hot air balloons, not just because we're filled with hot air, but because the balloon is moved by the wind. Sometimes the wind's pretty strong, and it's not hard to see which way that it's blowing and what direction it's going in. Sometimes the Spirit moves more like a gentle breeze, but God is still ready to guide you. And sometimes the wind isn't blowing at all. Sometimes you just need to stay put and wait for that wind, that breeze to come up so you know what direction is that God is wanting to take us. And so the question becomes each day then, Lord, where is your Spirit leading me? Where is the wind blowing? What direction are you taking us in? Are we going to be in tune enough with his movement that you'll follow him and follow his lead because it takes some sensitivity to keep up with the blowing of a gentle breeze. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've been following the Israelites. We're 
now at this point finally released from their slavery in Egypt, they've taken a motion. And they've taken some steps in a direction. Nine-year-old Joey was asked by his mother what he had learned in Sunday school. And so he said, well, Mom, our, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And when he got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge. All the people could walk across safely. And then he used the walkie-talkie to radio headquarters for reinforcements. And they sent bombers to blow up the bridge and all the Israelites were saved. His mother with the jaw dropped down to the (laughs) wide open said, Now, Joey, is that really what your teacher taught you? Joey said, Well, no, Mom, but if I told it the way the teacher did, you'd never believe it. You'd never believe it. We're going to look tonight at one of the most amazing stories, I think, in the Bible. Lots of people besides Joey have had trouble believing it over the years. And though we're going to look at some pretty cool stuff that's been uncovered really in the last 15 years, the bottom line is still the same, no matter how you look at it. And that is if you don't believe there's a God you're going to have a difficult time with the story. Anyone that doesn't believe in God, and I've had discussions with folks before, and how is that possible? And how, uh, it wasn't a miracle. It was just that, you know, it was, it was only like knee deep, and they just kind of waded through, you know. Or, and you think about, well, how does a chariot and, you know, a horse drown in a knee deep water, you know? Um, and not just one of them, hundreds and thousands of them, are, how many ever that they brought over, you know, you just... You see things and you just go, how can that be? How can it possibly be? And so with that in mind, if you believe that there's no God, guys, then you're going to have a hard time with the story. But I know you guys all believe in the Lord. So if you have those family members and such that that don't. But he says there in verse 1, he says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and they camp at Pihehiroth, between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon. And you shall camp before it by the sea. Now, Pihehiroth literally means mouth of the gorges. Migdal means tower. Therefore, it would seem that stop number three, campsite number three, God directed his people to camp between a cavernous mountain wherein it very is very possible that enemy troops could be hidden. There were caves and such that were dotted and scattered throughout the, cave, throughout the cavernous mountain. And, and it's very possible that, that troops could be hidden. And the military fortress also is depicted with their backs to the Red Sea. So one of the things, you know, they had stuff to the right, they had stuff to the left, they had stuff in front of them, the, the armies of Pharaoh, and they had the Red Sea behind them. They're kind of like, you could say, between a rock and a hard place. A very difficult situation. And I'm sure that in the course of them traveling and coming down here, that the advisors to Moses, especially the military advisors, must have said, Moses, this is not strategically very wise. I mean, if the Egyptians change their minds and pursue after us, then we would be sitting ducks. But the Lord would go on to explain his strategy to Moses. And so, noticing there that he says, make the turn and camp before uh, Paihe Hairoth. And then he says, between Migdal and the sea, Opposite Baal Zephon. Turn. And we've seen that God has helped the Israelites get away from Egypt, as I said earlier, with a pillar of cloud and a fire. And this would have allowed the Israelites to travel during the cool of the evening because they would have had that light that they could have used. And so in the night darkness of the desert, the Sinai Desert, 
they had the ability to continue moving, including being able to move through the Red Sea. And then in the evening when the sun was setting, they'd have that same ability with the cloud, but during the heat of the day, they could rest under the shade, we noticed, of the cloud that was out and before them. Here, as you look up to this point, the Israelites had basically just followed a well-known trade route from Egypt to Midian. It would have been the same trade route that Moses probably traveled on 40 years earlier when he fled from Pharaoh and he ended up living in Midian, tending to sheep, so the sheep of Jethro and Mary and Jethro's daughter. But instead of taking the route across land into Midian, God's going to do something different in, in the lives of the Israelites. He's going to do something and take them in a different direction. And some, I say that simply because sometimes that's what God desires to do within our life, to take us in a different direction other than what we had presumed. But the thing that you need to realize and understand, and as we go through here, you'll see God's guiding doesn't, is not dependent upon what it is that you want to do. It's up to him. We belong to him. We've been purchased uh, by him, by his blood on the cross. And so it's important that as you look through here and you see just the work that God is attempting and desiring to do within the children of Israel, that it's the same work that he desires to do within each one of us. And so you come to what would be the normal thing to do, and that is to go in the land route and go across over into Midian, avoiding any seas or whatever might be out there, swamplands or whatnot. And, and it would be a safer kind of a route, and not only that, but you'd get a whole lot less wet. The sea, it's not identified really in this chapter, but in the next chapter we're told that it was the Red Sea in Exodus Chapter 15, verse 4, the Hebrew word is Yam Kumpf, which can be translated Reed Sea. And even though there's some commentators who want to say this means that they didn't cross at the Red Sea, Yam Kumpf is clarified in another place, and that is in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 26, where it says, King Solomon also built a fleet of ships at Ezion, Geber, which is near Elath, on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Elath is an Israeli town on the far, far northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. My point is simply to show that Aqaba is considered to be a part of the Red Sea in the Bible. So, Pi Hehirath, um, mouth of caves or mouth of gorges, you know, is, is in that general vicinity. Now, a lot of times people ask the question, well, where is it that they crossed over? And there's approximately five different theories that you'll find on most Bible maps. And they tend to place the crossing on the border of Egypt, either in the north, um, across the, a region of lakes, which some people call the Sea of Reeds. Or some will put it on the Gulf of Suez um, as well. There's some problems, though, with these locations. Mostly, they don't fit the biblical description of that place. So when you read it in the Bible, it doesn't look anything like what the Bible describes. One problem of the classical crossing proposal is that they are within the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian border. So the crossing is actually in the border, and that creates a problem because the Bible says in verse 11 of chapter 14, then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? And so they're out of Egypt. They're not within the boundaries of Egypt. And yet these theories have it inside the boundaries. So the people already consider themselves outside of the borders of Egypt, not on the border. Uh, most theories of where they crossed are based on the assumption that the people have to get to the traditional place that is referred to as Mount Sinai 
in the Sinai Peninsula, but there's been a lot of evidence that's come forth that would tell us that Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula, uh, that it's in a different location. And a lot of people believe it was in where Midian is, and Midian being the place that God took actually uh, Moses apart over to where Jethro was raising his, his flocks of sheep. But but not in that place. And so, you know, not not being there where most people believe that Sinai Peninsula is and Sinai Mountain is on there. Um, there is, however, a mountain known today as Jabal Musa, which means the mountain of Moses. And for centuries, pilgrims traveled to this mountain where there's a monastery and you know, they, they spent many times uh, apart and away with the Lord. During the brief period of time that Israel had control over the Sinai Peninsula, there was, there was a, an opportunity for them and there was allowed for there to take place extensive archaeological research. And what they were looking for is evidence of two million people camping, basically, was what it came down to, which is pretty hard to miss. And so they were looking all over the Sinai Peninsula and they were not able to find any evidence really that there were two million people camping together out there for a year while Moses received the Ten Commandments. So very little substantial evidence was discovered. And so the question came up with these guys that look into these things, what if the traditional view of Sinai's location is wrong? You know, there were other ancient records that placed Mount Sinai as I said, in the ancient region of the Midianites. That was really basically, if you look at the Gulf of Aqaba, and then you have the Suez Canal over here, and you have the Gulf of Aqaba, and then you have over in this side, Saudi Arabia, up here, Iran. If you look at your maps, hopefully, perhaps in the back of your Bible, if you have them, um, you find that, that most... most uh, People that study this thing and, and archaeologists and those that, that dig and, and search for these things believe that it was over here where the Midians were, which is in the land of uh, Arabia. And so as you begin to look at this and uh, find that it's in Saudi, modern day, they believe modern day Saudi Arabia, Paul the apostle mentions the Sinai as being in Arabia as well in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. Josephus also places Mount Sinai in the area of Midian. And some have suggested that it's a mountain called Jebel al -Oaz. And we'll talk about that in a, few, in a couple, two, three weeks or so. But under the possibility that the region of Saudi Arabia was the correct direction, some scientists began to do some searches there and look in other places for the crossing and they found some pretty interesting things. Over This is really over the past 15 to 20 years that they've been discovering some new things. But they found a possible location for a crossing of the Red Sea that made a whole lot more sense than what has been presented to this point. And it was called a place, the place that they discovered is a place called Nueabi, a Nueaba. And, uh, you know, again... It's kind of interesting. Um, but as you look here, you know, one of the things that came to my mind when I was studying this is I think, what kind of Red Seas has God allowed in my life? And I was thinking even for your sakes, what kind of Red Seas has God allowed for there to be in your life? That insurmountable, that unpassable. I was reading another article that said in one place that there are places in the Red Sea that went as deep as like a mile. And I thought, gosh, you know, the water was as a wall. Well, that's a pretty formidable wall. I mean, you're talking, what is a mile? 5,200 and some odd feet or something like that. I mean, you're just going like, <laughs> you know. And, and I, I mean, it, it would just be so, you know, intimidating, I, I would think. And yet the whole while, God is you know, trying to get them to trust and depend and rely upon him and not to doubt and, and to really trust in the Lord with all of their, your heart. And I was thinking about that scripture in uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. But I, I think I would say that all the way through 
you know, going across on dry land, we're told, but yet still with a huge mound of water, if that's exactly what it was. Pretty amazing, though. It's one of those stories that you're going to want to know more about when you get to heaven. But beyond that, there are those opportunities, and I say opportunity because, you know, a lot of people would look at it and go, no, no, that's not an opportunity. That's that's uh, something to be avoided. That's something that's something that, that you never want to have happen to you. And that's having a Red Sea in your path or, in, in you know, in the midst of your walk just to run into that Red Sea. But this is one of those situations, you know. And, and the thing that here is amazing me when you follow the analogy out, who is it that led them to the Red Sea? Who is it that led them to having the Red Sea at their back Mountains on their right, mountains on their left, oh my, and having, you know, Pharaoh's army coming down right smack dab, doing a headbutt, you know, with you. Who led him there? God did. And I thought, you know, who leads us to our Red Seas? You know, those, those major obstacles in our life, those major events that, that just seem so, so very much difficult, you know, to, for us to get through. That, that we really believe that, that, you know, it looks like we're in the wrong place, you know, between a rock and a hard place. But it's exactly where God wants us to be. Exactly where he wants us to be. And you might ask the question, why does God want them? I mean, why would God want that? I mean, doesn't he like us? You know, doesn't he want the best for us? You know, we've heard that. God wants his best for you. But what if his best is having the Red Sea at your back, you know, the mountains to the left and right, and your enemy right in front of you, breathing down your neck? What if that's what God desires for you to go through? And then, like I said, the next question is, why? Why does God want them to be trapped between the sea and the Egyptian army? It's so that they will trust him. I'm not sure we'd learn to trust him if we never encountered a Red Sea. Do you? I'm not sure. I think we need more Red Seas probably. I, don't, I exercise caution in saying that because I'm not really looking forward to something like that. But I realize their value, and I hope you do too, that there's a, a tremendous amount of value that God puts in those times that he takes us through, uh, those Red Sea events that, that we find ourselves in. And uh, man, it, it, it accomplishes exactly what God wants to accomplish, what he wants us to trust in him. And I'm, like I said, not sure that we'd learn how to trust in him had we never, or do, if we never encountered a Red Sea. If we never encountered a Red Sea, we'd never see God part a Red Sea. Let's put it that way. And so here they are. They're camped before the Red Sea behind them and the mountain before and beside them. And verse 3 says, For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has closed them in. And so here's the thing. I mean, think about it. When you're going through hard and difficult times, you know those people that just love to hear the bad news about you. Really? That really? That happened to them? They got in an accident? Whoa! You know, and you're just like, shut up, you know? What is wrong with you? But they love to hear your bad news, you know, because cause it makes them feel better, I guess. I don't, I don't know exactly. I, although we've been, I'm sure, on both sides, haven't we? Couldn't have happened to a better guy, a nicer guy. But it happened. And so here, they're kind of dazed and confused. They're wandering. And, and at least that's the interpretation that comes back to Pharaoh. That the Israelites are lost. They're lost. They're forsaken. They're confused. They're dazed. They're, they're in trouble. And so verse 4 says, Then I will harden, God says, Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them 
And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army. That the Egyptians might know that I am the Lord. And they did so. I mean, surely the Egyptians knew that the true and living God was Lord over all. I mean, if the frogs and the flies hadn't convinced them of this, the blood and the boils, the hail and the lice and the horror of the death of their firstborn son surely would have done so. But they still had one of ace up their sleeve. It was their awesome, legendary, invincible army. And thus they needed to see God's preeminence over their military proudness. God had already said, you need to know that I am the God of all gods, that I am sovereign and that there is none other. There is no other beside me, God said. But the Egyptians, it seemed like, learned that lesson. But now we're finding out, no, we have one ace in the hole. We have one more way. We have one more thing. And so they needed to see God's preeminence over them. And so verse 5, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? What is wrong with us? That we have let Israel go from serving us. And so he made ready his chariot and he took his people with him. Realizing that he had this dynamic workforce. Realizing that, that man, what did I do? He made ready pursuit of the Israelites. He got things together. And so we see here that he took, verse 7 says, 600 choice chariots. I mean, the Egyptians basically were the developers and inventors of the chariot. They, they were the ones like today would have the, what is it, the hypersonic missiles? You know, they're the ones that would have the highfalutin. I, I was reading something with all this talk of war and invasions and stuff like that that's going on over in Ubekistan. There was they were talking about this one weapon that's like it has carries like twenty four missiles and they're more like concussion missiles where they go to where the target is, they explode and they basically literally take the breath away from the soldiers. The concussion or the you know whatever it is is ba boom and it calls like they have like a, vi a vacuum cycle. And so it blows the air out and sucks the air back in. And as it does it, it sucks it right out of the soldiers that are within range of it. And here he's got like concussion chariots. You know, they're just like, they're like the, 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 the prime, the choice, the choice ones. And so he says, we've let them go. What were we thinking about? We've got to go get them. And so he makes ready his chariots to take his people with him, realizing He's lost his workforce. And then he also took 600 additional choice chariots. And again, the Hebrew word is chosen or choice. In other words, like I said, these were more sophisticated weapons in the day. Most sophisticated weapons of the day. And uh, the F-35s, you know. And, and the, 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 again, these guys were the inventors, so they seemed to left all the enemies, you know, technologically, they've left them in the dust. Verse 7 goes on, and all the chariots, all the chariots, so not just the 600 choice, not just the select few, but all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every single one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. Can you believe Pharaoh? He's lost his son. He's been devastated. His country has been devastated. And yet, he still has the fight in him. He still has the hardness of heart that tells him to pursue after, even though he's lost so very much. He's willing to lose it all. And so they go to the children of Israel, the children of Israel going out with boldness. They went out with, it says, a high hand, maybe some of your Bibles, but speaking of a boldness, which means they went out rejoicing. They went out celebrating, giving each other high fives, so to speak. And so the Egyptians, verse 9, pursued them. 
all the horses and chariots and all the, the, the soldiers of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army. And they overtook them camping by the sea of pi hey before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes. The children of Israel lifted their eyes. The problem was they didn't lift them high enough. They lifted them up to see what the problem was, but they didn't lift their eyes up to see or enough to see their protector. And that's us, guys. We need to be careful not to go short of what the Lord would want us to do. We can look up and we can see as we lift our eyes up the enemy lining up. We can see the enemy, you know, and they look formidable. They've got those chariots. They've got the best weapons. They've got the best everything. They've got, you know, these soldiers that have trained their whole entire life to be soldiers. And they're going to rip us to shreds. But if they would have looked just a little bit higher, they would have seen the Lord of hosts and angels. They would have seen the hand of God upon them. Well, the Egyptians pursued them. Israel lifted up their eyes. Not far enough. And verse 10 goes on. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And so they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Josephus writes in Antiquities, uh, book 215. He said, they also seized on the passages by which they imagined the Hebrews might fly, shutting them up between inaccessible precipices and the sea. For there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea. The areas leading up to Nuev Abi sound exactly as they're described, like what Josephus and the Bible describe. It's full of deep canyons. If you can go to a Google and, and even uh, click on, do a search on some of these, these towns that you see here in chapter 14 of Exodus, it's kind of cool to see the pictures that they have in there of these areas because they're exactly as they're described, high cliffs, deep canyons, caves that you can hide in. And as you come out of the canyons, in this one particular area, you find a beach where there's now a Hilton Hotel, by the way. And from that beach, you look across the 10 miles of Aqua and the mountains of Midian, which is now Saudi Arabia. When you look at these things, though, and that Red Sea of yours, you kind of come to the realization that you're helpless without God in our Red Seas, in our circumstances, in our situations. We're helpless without God. In reality, that's the case with every human on earth, though not many recognize it and realize it. We think we can do anything, but we are helpless without God. Now, this doesn't mean that we're ever beyond God's help. Some people get to the place where they feel like even God can't help them. They feel that God could no longer love them, but they're, they couldn't be more wrong. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He took the blame. He took the pain. He took the blows. And then they said unto Moses, verse 11, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now, because Egyptian culture gave a really high priority to the afterlife, I mean, it's evidenced by the pyramids and the mummification and, and all that stuff, that they, mummies that they have and all. So for the Israelites to insinuate that there were no graves in Egypt was ridiculous. It's nonsense. I find it amazing how easy 
we can get mixed up, how skewed our perspectives become when we stray from the Word of God, when we stray from what the Lord has told us. Verse 11 goes on to say, Well, why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? I think just a little bit of sarcasm here, guys. And again, Egypt was known for its many tombs. Perhaps Moses didn't feel there were enough tombs for them all to die. And again, understand why they were so desperate. They have the mountains to the north, to the south. They have the sea to the east and the Egyptians closing in on the west. There's nowhere to run. Why did the Lord lead his people out only to seemingly box them in? Three reasons, I think, for you guys to jot down if you want. The first reason is um, God having a desire to show them his power. We sing that song tonight, more love, more power, more of you in my life. And to that, the Lord would respond, more love, more power, more of me in your life. And so here's Pihiroth. There's Migdal. I'm going to plant you, the Lord says, right between them with your backs to the Red Sea. I'm going to put you in a place that you can't strategize. You can't rationalize. And you can't compromise your way out of this situation, this circumstance. And I'm going to do that in order that I might show you my power to deliver you in ways you would never have imagined, that you never would have thought about. God wants to reveal to you just how good and how great and how awesome he is. To show his power, not just to the Egyptians, but to show his power also to us for those times that we would doubt him, for those times that we'd say and sit and just begin to cry and say, there's no way out, there's no way out of this problem, of this situation. And God would say, yeah, just remember what I did in Egypt. Just remember what I did at the Red Sea. And we need to know that. We need to have that some place that we can memorialize it. Remember we were talking about that it's best to learn from the experience of, of others, guys, because we don't want to have to go through it ourselves. We don't want to have to have the pain and, and the sorrow and the heartache of, of that. We can learn just as effectively, the Lord would say, through the experience that someone else goes through. So we need to look at these things that the Israelites were struggling with and going through in their own life that we can learn from and learn what God wants to show us, that he wanted to show and reveal his power and who he was, what he was able to do. More love, more power, more of you, Lord, in my life. And so verse 12, he says, Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Didn't we tell you this? Saying that let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And so here were the mumblers and the murmurs and the complainers and the grumblers. Man, it, it, we told you this. We, we'd had this discussion. We would rather stay in Egypt and have our leeks and onions when in reality leeks and onions were growing in, in Israel. We talked about that last week. But let us alone, they said, that we might serve the Egyptians. This, this won't be the last time they wish they could go back to Egypt either. It happened again a couple more times. But some of the people had begun to insist, leave me alone. Leave me in Egypt. I'll just muddle through on my own because even though I've walked with the Lord and even though I followed after him, look where I'm at now. Look at my position now. My back is to the Red Sea. I mean, what am I going to do? I'm between a mountain of caves and a fortified tower. And here comes Pharaoh's army bearing down on me. And Moses, verse 13, said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. 
For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Guys, this is one of those verses you want to have on your mirror in the bathroom or in your mirror in the bedroom or in a place that you can see it on a regular basis. Stand still. Sometimes the Lord tells us to stand still. Sometimes the Lord says, go, get, get up and go, get going. And he'll reveal to you which it is. But here at this point, he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's not asking you to do anything. He says, see the salvation of the Lord, which he, the Lord, will accomplish for you today. For those Egyptians you see today, you're not going to see him again. A dying David said to his son, be strong and show thyself a man. First Kings 2.2. Or literally play the part of a man. Paul tells us, put on the whole armor of God that you may resist the devil and having done all to stand. To stand, stand, be strong. Play the part of a man, stand. Having done all to stand. Moses said to the people, even as the word would say to us today, guys, don't give in. Don't fall down. Don't go back. Stand. Stand for the Lord. Stand for the Lord with all of your might. Why? Notice verse 14. For what? The Lord will fight for you. I believe the second reason the Lord planted his people between Pihei Roth and Migdal was that they might experience his presence. That they might experience the presence of the Lord. Haven't you found that when it's you and you're between that rock and a hard place that you perceive the Lord's presence in your life most clearly. I don't know about you, but I do. It's like, whoa. You know, and we're sitting there praying and we're going like, Lord, give us a greater awareness of your presence in our life. And the next thing we know, we're sitting there staring, you know, at the enemy and we've got the Red Sea behind us and, you know, whatever that takes the, the shape of, you know, in our life. And... You know, it's at those times that God says, this is where you experience my presence if you allow it. If you let it happen. If you choose to open the floodgates, I will come into you and I will sup with you and you with me. And there'll be that fellowship and there'll be that intimacy. There'll be that communion and that love and that grace and that mercy and, and just those things that God would desire to accomplish within your life. And it won't matter whether you have the mountains on your left with caverns and caves and canyons and such and you have the strong towers of Migdal on the right. It won't matter because his presence is with you. And notice verse 14 goes on to say, and you shall, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. In other words, Moses said to the people, when you see the Lord fight for you, you're going to regret your whining and you'll quiet down, and you'll hold your peace. The Israelites are not strong enough to fight the Egyptians. God's going to have to be the one that take care of, takes care of Pharaoh. The victory's going to have to be in, in the Lord. And that's what we've got to come to the point where we realize that, hey, the victory's mine because God's won it and he's given it to me. But we didn't have anything to do with, with bringing it to, to come about, to, to bring it into place. And so you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said, verse 15, to Moses, why do you cry to me? Why, why do I hear you crying to me? You know, it's like what you might say to your, your child. You know, it's like, you know, I, I know a little Eli, you know, sometimes, I want a seven up. You can't have a seven up, it's past seven. I want a seven up. Why are you crying? And we ask that question, we go, Eli, why are you crying? I don't know. <laughs> There's no really no good reason, but yet I have to not laugh too hard because I do the same thing with the Lord. <laughs> Lord, why are you, you know, and God's saying, why are you crying? And he says to Moses, Moses, don't cry. Rather, tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now, this is opposite of what he just said, didn't it? Initially, he said, stand, stand firm, stand before the Lord. Stand up. But here he says, go forward. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me that there's a time to pray 
and this is a time to proceed. It tells me that there's a time to stand and a time to move forward. And now is the time to move forward. And it was up to Moses to set the pace. Don't just stop here and talk. Get moving. Stand and go. And you got to understand that these are two parts of the same deliverance. Standing and going. Two parts of the same defense, the same deliverance, guys. There is a truth standing to the fact that all we can do is stand and watch God work. Our salvation is not accomplished by us, but by Christ. He had to die on a cross and he had to pay the horrible penalty of our sin. And so all we can do sometimes is stand and watch God working, but then go. There's a point that if you want to be saved, you need to respond, that you need to take a step. The Israelites aren't going to be saved by standing on the seashore. They have to walk across to the other side. And likewise, we aren't always going to be saved from our sins unless we make a choice to trust in the Lord. We must make a choice to follow after him. You have to do both, guys. You have to stand and go whatever it is that you're doing. Maybe you're fighting or know someone that's fighting addictions. You got to stand and go. You must get to the point where you realize you're helpless to fight the battle. But then you also must get up and walk across to the other side. And that goes with anything that you're dealing with. Any, excuse me, bad habits, any addictions, any drugs, any, anything, uh, whatever it might be, you know, anger, temper, Gossip, you know, uh, you know, things on the computer, things on the TV, you know, whatever it might be. You've got to get to the point where you realize, number one, you're helpless to fight that battle. But you also got to get up and walk across the other side and realize that God is your fortress. He is your mighty tower, strong tower. He is the one that's going to give us the victory. Verse 16, but lift up your rod, talking again to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel so go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Water's emblematic of the word. Therefore, Moses dividing the sea is a picture of what we are to do. Dad's in the dividing of the scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15. Cut asunder, guys. Hold out your rod of authority and say to your son, say to your daughter, follow me. And then set the pace and lead the way. Verse 17, And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army, all of his army, his chariots and his horsemen. And then the Egyptians shall know that, know that I am the Lord. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So the third reason that God boxed his people in between pi he Hiroth, and Migdal was because he wanted to give a demonstration of his preeminence. Even more fundamental than our experiencing his power and his presence is the world's understanding of his sovereignty. And here he says, I'm going to put you in this horrible predicament. I'm going to put you in this tough spot. This brutal place, he says, because I want to make myself known to the Egyptians. Oh, we say, I'm stuck in this marriage. I'm stuck with that parent. I'm stuck in a financial crunch. We, we cry, failing to understand that sometimes, sometimes he can touch people who don't know him by putting us in uncomfortable and difficult and heartbreaking and challenging situations. You ever seen that? I mean, we... We are so quick, so with time, so many, oh, so often we're so quick to just start murmuring and complaining because we're going through something and we don't really realize why we're going through it. We just think God's making life tough on us. But the reality is he's got somebody else he's working on that's within close enough proximity of you who are going to be touched, perhaps even saved, because they see you going through something similar and rather than you coming unraveled or falling apart, you're on your knees and you're praying and they're seeing it and they're just like blown away. 
Because they don't understand why it is that you're going through that. And you're going through it with such blazing colors, so to speak. Guys, the thing that you need to realize, you know, in those challenging situations and those heartbreaking things and heartaches that, that happen in our life, you've got to understand that God doesn't exist for us. And I want you to think about that a while. God doesn't exist for us. We exist for him. So scandalized was the church that for decades she refused to acknowledge Copernicus, uh, 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 discovery that Copernicus, I'm sorry, like that. Copernicus, and the discovery that he made. How, after all, could the sun be the center of the planetary system? And surely the planets revolved all around the earth, around man. And they didn't want to accept anything that he presented, whether it was proof positive that it was other than what they thought it was, that we didn't rotate around earth or the man, you know, that, that it was set up in a different way. And I think that it remains equally shocking today to many, 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 many people to discover that it's the capital S-O-N rather than our own worlds or our own concerns or our own comfort that's at the center of God's creation. It's not until though we finally understand that we exist for God rather than he existing for us. And it's at that point that the rotation of our worlds, our situations, and our lives begin to make sense if we just come to that point. I mean, if the pain doesn't go away, if the business doesn't work out, if the marriage isn't great, God would say, I love you, but it's not about you. I see so many people, it's just like, well, you don't understand. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's not me, it's God's word. And as he describes his preeminence, his sovereignty, his power, his ability, and he says, you know what? If I choose to use you in this way, if I choose to make you a vessel of dishonor, if I choose to make you a spittoon, I have a bigger plan. And it's not about you. Because you see, the Egyptians, the Egyptians of this world are watching you. The Egyptians in your neighborhood are watching you. The Egyptians at your workplace are watching. Those, those Egyptians, they're really watching you. And when the people you work with continue to see you praise the Lord, when your neighbors see you worshiping the Lord, when your family sees you thanking the Lord, God would say to us, I will be glorified. You can fight it until the day you die or you can finally come to a place in your life where you say, you know what? The sun, S-O-N, is the center of everything. Come what may, the sun is the center of my universe. And although life may not seem fair right now, it eventually will be. The waters will part. You'll be ushered into eternity where you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I had you boxed in, but you stood still. You stood firm. You stood strong. And you didn't fall away. And you didn't turn back. And you didn't walk out. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I think maybe one great example is special teams on a football team. Special teams are the ones that handle the kickoff and kickoff return and punt and punt return and field goal extra point. They're the ones that are out there that probably have the best grasp of this idea because special teams is basically suicide. Special teams, and they've changed it, the rules, they tried to protect them more, but it's still pretty crazy out there because special teams charge down the field as fast and as hard as they possibly can. And they throw their bodies directly at men like speeding bullets who are also running full stream ahead in their direction. And they crack heads, not so much. Like I said, they've eliminated or made illegal spear and things like that. But there's still the same collisions that are violent. People say football is a contact sport. It's not a contact sport. It's a collision sport. And it takes a toll. And here you see an analogy or, or a similarity 
in special teams. They take hits. They endure pain. Why? So that the one who carries the ball can gain the yards. Such a simple concept. But sometimes it takes decades to understand that we're not the S-U-N, that we're not the ball carrier, but that we exist for the one who is. And the degree to which we allow him to do what he wants to do in our lives is the degree to which we'll be rewarded immensely, immeasurably, and eternally. Verse 19, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. The angel of the Lord known as a Christophany. An appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament before he came as the babe in Bethlehem. Jesus, who previously went before them, now went behind them to be the rear guard, to cover their backs. I like that. And the pillar cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And thus it was a cloud and a darkness to the one, but it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near to the other. They were separated from each other by the darkness and the light. And the cloud that was darkness to the Egyptians, it was light for God's children. And the same is true of the word. Those who choose to walk in darkness because they love the darkness rather than the light, John 3.19. The Bible is confusing to them. But to those who seek to walk in the light, John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it is a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. And so the cloud puts the Egyptians in the darkness on one side. And on the other side, it's given light to the Israelites so that they can cross the Red Sea at nighttime in the dark. Verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to, grow, uh, to go back by a strong east wind all that night. It took a long time. And made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. And so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. The morning watch was between 2 a.m. and dawn. And he troubled them. Mentions that there was also a rainstorm, lightning, and earthquake in Psalm 77. But there was a troubling that was taking place. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. I should say so. I mean, can you know wheels? It probably, it's like a skid plate. It's just being dragged across the sand. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Man, they got it. The Lord is fighting for them. And so with their chariots bogged down in the middle of the Red Sea, the Egyptians knew they were in trouble, but it would prove to be too late. And then the Lord said, verse 26 to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back to the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. And so the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the, notice again that the water was deep enough to drown the Egyptian army. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. I mean, even if you choose to accept the things that have been found over the last 15 years or so, and you begin to accept the possibility that the Israelites did cross the Red Sea, you're still going to be faced with the fact that it didn't happen naturally. And people will struggle with that and, and fight with that till the cows come home. But somebody still had to part the waters. There is a God that you still need to believe in. But the children, verse 29, of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall to them on the right and the left side. And so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Could you imagine? Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. 
And so the people feared the Lord and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Finally, Pi Hehirath and Migdal illustrate the plan of God prophetically, as it is seen in Psalm 65 7, Daniel 7 2, and Revelation 17 15. With regard to future events, the nations are often referred to as a sea. And here in the Exodus account, the sea, the nations, part in order that the Israelites can reach the promised land. A lot of types and analogies, guys. But from this, we understand that any nation seeking to destroy Israel will ultimately see its plan parted in order that the people of Israel can go through on dry land. And I'm thinking more and more about that with Russia, with Putin. Yeah, it, it just, I mean, this is them right here in Exodus. And they're going to be parted. They're going to be, they're going to be parted, guys. They're going to be drowned in the Red Sea, whatever, whatever form that takes when they march beyond that and come down into Syria and join the Russians that are already in Syria. And they plan to go across the border in the Golan Heights and wipe Israel out. It will not be, you know, and that's, that's really the thing. That's one of the reasons why when we talk about what are we looking for, we're looking for the destruction of Damascus. That's really crucial and key. But obviously you're looking for Christ to come home. I mean, to come back to take us home to be with him. But in the meantime, your eyes should be on Damascus and what's happening to it and what's taking place there. So, good stuff. I mean, there's, there's just so much here. Um, I just encourage you guys to go back over it again and, and learn it because there's just such a depth and richness um, of application to our lives. You know, again, those red seas in your life and things that you're going through. Amen. Well, Father, we're just thankful, Lord, for your word. And we're just thankful for your faithfulness to us, Lord. That, Father, Lord, even when we doubt, even when we argue with you, Lord, well, Lord, it can't be or this can't be or whatever it might be. And, Lord, just to know that you're, you you are larger than all this. Your preeminence, your power, your presence, Lord. And Father, we need you so desperately because without you, we're nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so, Lord, we ask once again that you just come and you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, you'd give us that Holy Spirit resurrection power. That, Lord, we might walk and we might stand and we might go forward, Lord, when it's time to go forward and stand when it's time to stand. But that, Lord, you would just utilize us and, Father, work in us and through us. And, Lord, just use us in whatever way you want to. That, Father, as we soon see the day approaching, that, Lord, we might be there for that Egyptian neighbor, for that Egyptian work co-worker, for that Egyptian school person, Lord, whatever and whoever that might be. But that, Lord, we might be that witness because we don't do what everybody else does and we don't react the way that everybody else reacts. Lord, hopefully we do exactly what you want us to do to your glory and to your honor and to your praise. We love you and we praise you now in Jesus' most precious, all beautiful name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, guys. Yes, what a beautiful name it is.